Maria. Ave Maria. And what a joy to be back with the day with Mary, to the first day with Mary since COVID began. So how tremendous to be here and to see so many of you once again. Praise be to God and to our Blessed Lady. I'm conscious, always speaking in front of the Blessed Sacrament, our Lord truly present, that we should acknowledge him always. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. One of my favorite saints is St. Louis-Marie de Montfort. He was one of the great Marian saints, and he always said a Hail Mary before every sermon. And he said the difference it made was tremendous. So let's say Hail Mary to begin with. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. This is the month of the Holy Rosary. It's October, and so we'll talk about the Rosary. Uh, St. Louis-Marie de Montfort wrote a book, which I got when I was a boy, uh, on the Rosary. It was called The Secret of the Rosary. I remember getting the copy of it. It was the tan book version. Some of you will know the edition. It's got a picture of Our Lady on the front, a very colorful devotional image of her. And I read it then and it encouraged me to pray more fervently and more consistently the rosary. And I've just been rereading that during the last few weeks in spiritual reading to return to it and it's full of treasures. I want to recommend that book to you, The Secret of the Rosary. In fact, it was written by Louis-Marie de Montfort but not published till after his death. And so it's a little bit of a secret that he kept that was revealed later. And Louis-Marie de Montfort was a 17th, late 17th, early 18th century saint, one of the great Marian saints. And he used to go around France to different towns preaching. He was an itinerant preacher. And he would go literally into the market squares as well as the churches and talk about Our Lady. And he literally changed France at the time by his preaching, even physically, because at the end of every mission he gave, he got all the people to build a mound, a huge mound of soil to create a calvary so you could do the way of the cross with Our Lady and pray the rosary. And so even to this day, there are still physical reminders of his preaching. He divided that book, The Secret of the Rosary, into 50 chapters, short little chapters, and they're called 50 Roses. So each one is a different rose. And he would talk about the doctrine of the rosary, how it came to be, stories and miracles connected with the devotion to the Holy Rosary. It's all there and it's very, very beautiful. And I want to really to promote the rosary today as he did. One of his titles was The Man with the Big Rosary. So I managed to find the biggest rosary that I could find to bring along today, uh, just so it's here, to remind us that while each bead seems small, it's actually very, very big and very, very important, each one. The Secret of the Rosary was written for many different groups, for all classes of people from all different backgrounds. He says, I give you a white rose, priests, to preach the rosary. I give a crimson rose, a red rose, to ordinary men and women for the precious blood it stands, to get them to leave off the inferior roses of pleasures, honors, riches, which only bring them thorns, and to exchange them for these undying roses. I give a golden rose from heaven to the good and devout souls, and I give to each child, and I can see some children here, to each one a seed of the rose to grow as they develop in their prayer. He focuses, of course, as we should when we talk about the rosary, on the two great prayers that make it up. 
the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, and the Hail Mary. Of course, we know why the Lord's Prayer is so important, because it was given by Christ himself when the apostles said, teach us to pray. And it contains a summary of everything. But also, the Hail Mary he calls the angelic salutation. Some people think the Hail Mary is an extra prayer added by the church. But if you look at it carefully, it's coming direct, direct from Scripture from the angel Gabriel announcing the incarnation to Our Lady and from Saint Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary, saying, blessed are you among women. It's right at the beginning of all things. It's about the greatest event in history, the incarnation itself, when the word became flesh. All the hope of all the world is in that greeting. Hail Mary or Ave Maria. I think that's why you, you say the day with Mary, that greeting. Saint Louis-Marie de Montfort makes a lovely play on the words because if you turn Ave around, reverse it, it spells Eva, which is the, the name for Eve. So Mary reverses Eve. She is the new Eve. And the Hail Mary is, de Montfort says, the new song. He writes this. It is the new hymn of the law of grace, the joy of angels and men and the hymn that terrifies devils and puts them to shame. By the angelic salutation, God became man. A virgin became the mother of God. The souls of the just were delivered from shell. The empty thrones of heaven have been filled. Sin has been pardoned. Grace has been given to us. The sick made well, the dead brought to life. The blessed Trinity well pleased, and men have obtained eternal life. Ave Maria. It's beautiful, isn't it? And that's the, the power of each Hail Mary. He says that God the Father is glorified as we honor Our Lady, the most perfect of His creatures. God the Son is glorified in that we praise His most pure Mother. And the Holy Spirit is glorified as we are lost in admiration at the graces He poured upon His spouse. Because some people get a bit scrupulous about this. They think if you spend too much time with Mary, you're somehow taking away from Jesus. Have you heard that before? They have this scruple. I think it probably comes from the Protestant Reformation, but some people just have this worry. But that's not how it works in the family of God. Whenever we praise Mary, she praises our Lord. I call it the Magnificat bounce. Do you remember the Magnificat in the Gospel of Luke? When Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women, and immediately Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord. So it rebounds from her, but even more perfectly. It magnifies within her. Whatever we, we say to her, it's magnified to our Lord. Remember that Jesus came to us through Our Lady, and he wants us to go to him through her too. This family of the church has a mother. St. Louis-Marie de Montfort speaks of the importance not just of the prayers, the, the vocal prayers, but also the mysteries, the mysteries of the rosary. They're the, the stories. Each ten beads has a different mystery, and they're part of different sets of mysteries. Traditionally, the joyful, the sorrowful, the glorious. There have been different mysteries over time. There's the luminous people often pray, but classically it was those, those three. And he speaks of, from those mysteries, 15 virtues, 15 shining mirrors, 15 fiery furnaces. And he says, just to say the words, however wonderful they are, without the meditations is like a soul, without, with, like a body without a soul. You need both, the body and the soul. So the physical words, the verbal expression of their Hail Marys, the Our Fathers are like the body, but the meditation on the mysteries is like the soul of the rosary. We become like the things we contemplate. He says that our souls are like a canvas. And when we meditate upon these great mysteries of our Lord and Our Lady's life, that canvas gets imprinted. And the gospel message goes not just into the head, but right down into the heart. 
This is what John Henry Newman, whose feast day it is today, by the way, this is what he said when he preached about the rosary. He preached a beautiful sermon. After he became cardinal, he went to Oscott to preach to the young seminarians and to tell them to pray the rosary. So here's the words from England's newest saint. Now the great power of the rosary lies in this, that it makes the creed into prayer. The rosary gives us the great truths of Jesus' life and death to meditate upon, but brings them near, nearer to our hearts. And so we contemplate all the great mysteries of his life and his birth in the manger, and so too the mysteries of his suffering and his glorified life but even Christians, with all their knowledge of God, have usually more awe than love of him. And the special virtue of the rosary lies in the special way in which it looks at these mysteries. For with all our thoughts of him are mingled with thoughts of his mother. And in the relations between mother and son, we have set before us that great love. You see the difference when you're looking at Jesus and these mysteries with Mary, through Mary's eyes, it helps us to move these doctrines of the faith downward to get into the heart. And it's our hearts that have to be changed. We are in need of heart surgery. That's what we need. And that's what the rosary is doing. St. Louis Marie de Montfort in The Secret of the rosary also explains how the rosary came to exist. He said there were many forms of praying beads in the past, and often 150 beads, which would be the three mysteries, would be prayed to uh, substitute for the 150 psalms. The psalms that are in the Bible that priests and nuns and many lay people pray, and in the past, you, you had to get through all 150 psalms in one week. And that was the challenge with the, with the, the breviary, with the divine office. And a lot of you prayed the beads as a substitute for that. But he said the present rosary that we have in its present form comes from the 13th century, from St. Dominic. And then it becomes the angelic Psalter, Psalter coming from the Psalms. Each Hail Mary contains within itself a psalm, he says, just as the Old Testament is hidden in the New and revealed fully in the New. The story about St. Dominic is that he was in southern France in Toulouse, and that whole region had been lost to the Catholic faith virtually by the heresy of the Albigensians. And St. Dominic's task was to preach about the Catholic faith. And he was preaching, and he was preaching, and he was preaching, and nobody was changing. He wasn't winning people back to the faith. And so he made a retreat of three days, and he fasted, and he prayed in a monastery. And at the end of it, Our Lady appeared to him, and she said this, Do you know the weapon, dear Dominic, the Blessed Trinity wants to use to reform the world? And she gave him the rosary. And he began then to preach about the rosary. And he began to have success. And people were won back, stage by stage, to the Catholic faith in that region. There's another story of St. Dominic, when he was asked after that to preach in Paris at the great cathedral of Notre Dame. You know the cathedral that had the fire a few years ago and all the, the glitterati of Paris were there, all the scholars and the professors and the nobility, they were all there to hear the sermon of Dominic Guzman. And whilst he was praying the rosary before he preached, Our Lady spoke to him and she said, leave that sermon alone. I want you to read this little book. And he took a book from the, that she indicated to him and it was all about the rosary in the simplest, the simplest terms, like a simple man's rosary book. And he read that, he put his other sermon aside, and he preached from his heart. 
and it had a tremendous effect upon people. Even the scholars said that was a great sermon. Maybe if you'd read his erudite sermon, it wouldn't have had the impact. We must trust Our Lady. The rosary actually means a crown of roses. And I think when we pray the rosary, we're putting that crown on Our Lady's head, just as you always do here, and the head of Our Lord, of course. Uh, de Montfort speaks about the writer Alphonsus Rodriguez, the Jesuit writer who saw when people were praying that these, these crowns were coming out of their mouths. But he said when people pray badly or distractedly or without love or care, the crowns are dirty or damaged. And so there's a good lesson there for us to pray well with concentration and with love. We live in the most challenging of times with great attacks on the church through secularism. We all feel that the chilling effects upon our families are very evident. And the, the secularism which takes the grace out of the lives of our loved ones, we know what it is. And there is a great assault on human life. We know about that, the scourges of abortion and euthanasia. And the very foundations of society are being shaken by the undermining of the family and nature's own order regarding even male and female. We can feel impotent and helpless in the face of these vast challenges and difficulties. It can be like a tidal wave that's coming, but we don't know what to do. Remember the words of Our Lady. Do you know the weapon, dear Dominic, the Blessed Trinity wants to use to reform the world? I believe that the rosary is our greatest defense and it is our greatest weapon. So let's take up the beads once again with confidence. I don't know if any of you were present at the March for Life just a few weeks ago in central London. And I remember as we processed from around the parliament praying and uh, making witness for the life of every unborn child, that there were a group of very angry people at the side of the road. And they were shouting, and they looked so full of hatred, I was shocked. And with some people, they were calling them names and abusing them. And one of the slogans that they had was, keep your rosaries off our ovaries. Did you hear that when you were, if some, have you heard that before? They were chanting this like a song. And I found it so strange because the March for Life isn't a Catholic thing. It's people joining different groups in society just to witness together to human life. It wasn't a Catholic procession of any kind. Were they just rhyming a, a ditty just to attack pious people? They seem to target something so small, something seemingly ineffectual. Why make that your chant? And of course, a lot of those people I did have great sorrow for because many of them were people who were hurt. Maybe they'd been treated particularly badly, maybe they'd been abandoned, maybe they didn't understand what they were saying. But they said nothing about the legal struggle, about education, about pressures in society, but the rosary. It was as if they knew that the battle is really over something spiritual between good and evil. The rosary. Remember, it is Our Lady who crushes the head of the serpent. He can't stand her humility and her victory through gentleness and patience and love. It burns him. The rosary is such a weapon of love to conquer evil, selfishness, hatred, and anger. A rosary Hail Mary around an ovary brought about the incarnation, the joy of joys, the freedom of freedoms, the liberation of all liberations. So we know where the battle is. Let's pray our rosary with confidence against all these challenges. 
And Our Lady has interceded before. There's a history to her intercession. Last week, we recalled 450 years since the famous Battle of Lepanto. Have you heard of this battle that took place? The origin of the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary comes from this. On the 7th of October, 1571, it looked as if Christendom was about to fall to the Ottoman forces. Their war machine had amassed on the shores of Western Greece, on the Gulf of Patras. The next stop was the Italian peninsula. The Ottoman expansion had been rapid and their armies well used to fighting together. They had spread across Northern Africa, as well as the Middle East and the Balkans and taken Greece. And now the Catholic forces were amassed together, a mixed group, not used to one another, Spanish and Venetians and Genovese and a few others. How were they to stop this onslaught? They were far outnumbered and the Ottoman fleet was the biggest in Western history. There was a saint, a descendant, a follower of Saint Dominic, Saint Pope Pius V, and he wore white, unlike the popes previously, which is interesting, that's why popes wear white, because he was a Dominican. And he knew the solution to this. It wasn't in military might, it wasn't in military strategy, it wasn't in sheer numbers. The solution to defend Christendom was in these beads. And he called all of the Catholics throughout the known world to pray, to pray hard so that our faith would survive, so that Christendom would survive. And before even receiving formal news that the battle had been won, the Holy Pope received a divine premonition and told all those around us, it is certain Our Lady has won the victory. And so it was on the 7th of October, 1571. And that is why that day became such a great feast day. And that is why October is the month of the Holy Rosary. And that is why I speak to you today about these beads. Again and again, Our Lady has shown us the power of her intercession in this Holy Rosary. Finally, I want to speak about our own personal spiritual lives, because you might think, oh, they're all very nice things. But if we don't go away and pray the rosary every day, or if we don't increase our devotion in the way we pray it, we will not make progress ourselves in the spiritual lives. And that is where the great battle is. Each of us, there's a battleground, there's a Lepanto inside of us. And that's the way we have to save our own souls first, as well as helping the others around us. There's no better singular advice I can give you than to pray the Holy Rosary. And if you already do, to pray it a little more. A very good and devout bishop told me recently that he took up praying the 15 mysteries every day. I think that's a very good example and great things will come of that. If you already pray the rosary, then the call, I think, is to pray it with more attention, more focus, more devotion. I often like to pray the rosary when I'm out and about, but one of the difficulties with that is you get distracted with lots of things. So sometimes it's better if one goes to a quiet place or kneels down or sits down. And what can often help us is to have a picture of the mysteries, a little book, something to help us keep our mind focused. In that great sermon that John Henry Newman gave to those seminarians at Oscott, he said, that is what he advised, to have some image in order to help to keep the mind at rest in those mysteries. St. Louis-Marie de Montfort said, the love of Our Lady is a sure sign that we are on the road to salvation. He said, each Hail Mary is like a diamond presented to our Lord, like a diamond. When I heard that, you know, I thought, lovely thought, but he's exaggerating. It's like hyperbole, you know, exaggeration. But then I was thinking about it. 
Each of these beads, when we pray them, echoes into eternity. All our possessions don't do that. Our houses won't last into eternity. Our clothes won't last into eternity. Our holidays or our toys, whatever we have, they don't last forever. But these, they do. They are worth more than the physical things that we have, than anything of this order. That's how precious they are. Every single Hail Mary is of that value. So I do not believe now it is an exaggeration. So pray these diamonds. Give them to the Lord and give your heart with them. And may God who has begun this good work in you bring it to a full completion. Ave Maria.